Good morning, Phil. Um, I'm going to ask you to start by saying and spelling your last name. My name is uh, Bill Van Regen Mortar, and you spell that. Bill is pretty easy to spell. Van Regen Mortar, a little tougher. V A N, capital R E G E N M O R T E R. Uh, thank you, Bill, for joining us and for being our first interview in the Oral History Project West Coast versions. I want to start by asking you, how and why did you first get involved in the Crime Victims Movement? Impacted by some victims, two widows, both of whose husbands had been killed in a drunk driving crash. Uh, the guy who killed them both had a, a record as long as anyone's arm relative to drunk driving. Finally, ended. Uh, ended that record by killing uh, these two young men. Fathers of small children, husbands of young wives. They, the two wives, simply wanted to attend the trial. The trial was held in a county some distance from where they lived. And when they called the judge, the judge told them that this was none of their business, that uh, a, ma a criminal matter in Michigan is, uh, is represented by the prosecuting attorney who represents the state of Michigan and the defendant, and that uh, the victims have no place there. So they called the prosecutor, and the prosecutor, a little more politely, said the same basic thing. And they, at the time I was uh, running for office, and they approached me with their experience, and I thought, this is uh, absolutely inappropriate way to treat somebody who's been so victimized by a crime. And so I made a pledge that uh, I would, uh, I would start writing a Bill of Rights for Crime Victims in Michigan. And what year were, were, were those crimes? That was 1982. So that was when MAD was actually very nascent at that point. I mean, there wasn't the huge national anti-drunk driving movement. That's right. MAD sort of came in later, and in, certainly in a very powerful way, but it was a bit later. Wow. Um, <coughs> When you got involved in um, in 1982, can you describe what the the field was like in terms of victims' rights and services, but also maybe give us a, a, a little bit about the context of the era in 1982 and take us as far to 2003 as you want to? Well, I assumed in 1982 and 1983, we really began working on it in 19, early in 1983, uh, I assumed there'd be lots of material, research material for us to use. and found there was very, very little. We contacted every state and said something like this, do you have a Bill of Rights for Crime Victims? And if you do, send us a copy. 38 states responded. Only two had anything resembling uh, victims mandated, legally mandated victims' rights, uh, one of which was uh, uh, from a close friend, Steve Doreen in Wisconsin. A beautiful list of of uh, what should be mandated legal rights, but they were preceded by the words, it is recommended that the following rights be granted victims. And then it was it concluded with the phrase that if the resources allow, well, when you say in government it is recommended, that is meaningless. Those are, we call those weasel words. They just have absolutely no impact whatsoever. And if you make uh, some activity contingent upon resources, it will never happen because states never have enough resources. So we used uh, the, the one wonderful document uh, was a report from uh, now Judge uh, Haight, uh, with, who appointed uh, her to head a task force, of course. Uh, uh, President Reagan appointed her to head a task force. And that task force report became an important part of our consideration. And we simply went uh, everywhere we could to get some experiences. We relied upon all the professionals in Michigan who uh, would have any connection whatsoever with victims. Um, you are known as one of the, the, the earliest leaders in terms of um, really pushing victims as a, a, a policy um, agenda. What was that like, just in terms of trying to uh, make victims' issues, frankly, just matter in terms of uh, legislatures? And, and, and also, if you could talk a little bit, Bill, about how others started coming to Michigan. We, we found there was a little reception, a little good reception for the idea of, of crime victims' rights. And the argument that was put forward is an old one, and that is that somehow 
granting rights to victims of crime to somehow diminishes the rights for the criminal defendant. And so our first hurdle was to convince people that no, there can be a parallel track. We are we want to protect rights for criminal defendants and not take them away. But we think that the person who typically is most impacted by the crime ought to have rights. The person who chaired the committee in that in the House, the committee that heard the bill initially, was uh, very much in opposition and kept offering amendments which would have effectively uh, uh, gutted the program entirely. Uh, we were able, however, finally to bring in a number of victims, a number of law enforcement officers, a number of prosecutors offices to demonstrate how badly needed recognition for victims really was. Um. Looking at uh, you know your pioneering area of victim assistance, and I'm going to stick with policy, but maybe go into a few other areas as well. What do you think was the greatest challenge that you and your colleagues faced, both in Michigan but also other policymakers, um, in affecting change um, that would benefit crime victims? Uh, first, we had to convince people we could do it. It wasn't really a common thing at all. People liked to talk about victims, and victims should have rights, but. When one looked in Michigan's law, and we looked in a number of other states as well, uh, you really couldn't find uh, any any position that gave uh, standing to victims in in statute or in policy or in practice, and certainly not in the Constitution. And uh, Michigan is renowned, Bill, for being the first state, along with Florida. I'm never sure who made it first to pass the state constitutional amendment. Why do we need a constitutional amendment at the state level, and then we'll move into the higher level in a minute? Well, victims' rights, Michigan's constitution describes explicit rights for the criminal defendant in, um, in a number of very uh, direct ways, and there are at least 17 of them that are explicitly stated, and a host of others that are implied and in practice are actually applied. Victims were not mentioned in Michigan's Constitution. Again, victims are the persons who are most impacted by the crime. Our argument for a constitutional amendment was that we had to elevate the rights of crime victims to the same, at minimum, the same level as uh, the criminal, and uh, we had to provide some incentive for the system, uh, kind of an umbrella mandate, which I think the Constitution is, for the system to make sure that crime victims' rights are taken seriously. I, we did it sort of backwards in Michigan. I wrote the Crime Victims' Rights Act, the statutory provisions, first, and then we did the constitutional amendment second. But it gave us a chance to see how things worked. So with our, our as you know, our Crime Victims' Rights Act is very comprehensive. It really covers rights for the victim starting at the time of the crime. We have kind of a Miranda-like uh, provision which requires a law enforcement officer to, uh, within 24 hours, give the victim notice of certain rights and so on, then those proceed. And law enforcement, prosecution, and courts were took it seriously because it was statutory. But we had a few who did not. We had a judge. One of our one of the provisions is the right to attend trial, with uh, under most circumstances. And uh, we had uh, a case where a judge. Uh, decided to eject a victim upon a motion uh, from the defense in spite of meeting all the qualifications in the Crime Victims Rights Act for staying there. Uh, I talked to that judge who said something like, I'll do what I want in the courtroom. The legislature isn't going to tell me what to do. Now, Michigan has a, a kind of division of responsibility in its constitution. It does give practice and procedure authority to judges while it gives jurisdictional authority to the, uh, to the legislature. And we had uh, an another case uh, where, in, uh, where a woman who had been attacked viciously, his throat was cut uh, in an attempt to murder her, uh, wanted to give an impact statement. Again, that's a clear st statutory right in Michigan's Crime Victims' Rights Act that the judge must permit that statement and must consider that statement as well. So as she stood uh, before the judge with a huge bandage over the cut in her neck and said, you started, Your Honor, this is what the crime has done to me. The judge stopped her in mid-sentence and said, look, I've had a big day. I'm busy. I'm tired. I've heard all of this before and absolutely refused to let her 
uh, continue her impact statement. Now that happened to occur in front of news cameras. The local television station was taping the sentencing. And so, because I wrote the Crime Victims Rights Act, my office is really the clearinghouse for victim concerns in Michigan, and we get, I get a call at least every single day uh, from a victim or a victim advocate somewhere, usually in Michigan, but not uh, always. So I had a call immediately from a victim advocate and said, you won't believe what's happened, and sent the tape of the judge making that statement. And it is just a bold contradiction of the rights of, uh, of crime victims. I did talk to the judge later, but those two incidents, plus a few more, uh, made me determine that we, uh, we needed to elevate the rights of victims beyond the statute itself and support it with uh, constitutional amendment. And that's how the constitutional amendment became, well, uh, it was, uh, that's how it started. Did you uh, do a petition drive, or did you, at uh, what venue did you choose? Because all 33 states have used different venues to pass a constitutional amendment. What, what, the legislature can put something on the ballot, a constitutional amendment on the ballot, by passing a resolution with a two-thirds vote in both the House and the Senate. So I introduced such a resolution. We simply distilled, uh, by that time our Crime Victims Rights Act had uh, developed uh, pretty completely and was very comprehensive. So we simply distilled those fundamental rights and went back to the drawing boards to make sure that any other rights uh, that we hadn't thought about ought to be in there and did some legal research and put it before the legislature. It was uh, now people are sensitive in Michigan the legislature is sensitized to crime victims rights and I'm very pleased to that about that. So it passed the House, it passed the Senate with a two-thirds vote and went on the ballot that way passed overwhelmingly. In fact, uh, it's not real easy to put things on the ballot in Michigan, uh, not as easy as in some other states. And uh, frankly, the group we had uh, promoting it was uh, a bunch of uh, volunteers and victims from all over the state, but we worked together very well. We had a little budget, about $3,000 was our total budget. By the way, getting a constitutional amendment in uh, Michigan is viewed as a $3 million project at uh, at minimum, we had uh, at the day of the the day of the uh, before the election, we had three hundred dollars left in our purse, unspent. And uh, always a nervous uh, campaigner, I thought I'd hate to lose this constitutional amendment by about two votes because we didn't do what we should do. So we hired uh, a pilot with an airplane to to tow a banner around Michigan's principal cities for the last, he I was willing to do it for $300, exactly what we had left to, to net out our, our, uh, our purse. Well, the day of the election, it was overcast, almost zero visibility. One person, only one person on the whole state of Michigan told me they had actually seen the banner. The banner said, justice for victims, vote yes on B, it was proposal B at that time. Nevertheless, the uh, constitutional amendment passed by the largest number of votes and the biggest margin of any in the history of Michigan, and and I might say with the least amount of money spent. So it, victims' rights graduated very quickly in Michigan, and uh, that's sort of the background of the constitutional amendment. We did another way of doing a constitutional amendment. I know your question is going in that direction, is for the public to do it by petition, but because I was in the legislature and could do so. By that time, I had been sort of well-known for in Michigan for standing up for victims, and that's something that I'm proud of. I think, we, I think standing up for victims uh, uh, meets a commitment. I made a commitment when I was first elected. In fact, I use, uh, uh, not to get so religious here, but I use a verse from Proverbs as my legislative motto. And whether a person is religious or not, it makes some sense. It says, Proverbs 31, verse 8, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And uh, that's, I think, what victim advocates do in a, an outstanding way. I've been privileged to work with some wonderful advocates. That's great. We'll get to those in a minute. Um, the, actually, this is a great segue, Bill, because you just talked a little bit about some of the tactics. But in the early days, what were some of the secrets or the strategies or the, the tactics that you employed or, or others employed that were successful, and I think from your perspective, it's passing laws, but also you helped build a lot of um, victim assistance programs, system-based, community-based, and so on. What were some of the secrets? 
the we found that uh, implementation is uh, is of course the most significant. Writing a law saying victims should have rights. In fact, our law does not say victims should have rights. Our law says victims do have rights, and translating that into action was not easy. Uh, we determined that the that the professionals most likely to implement uh, victims' rights at all levels would be the prosecutors' offices because they tend to be there. So. We assigned in the in the law itself. We assigned the implementation to prosecutors' offices, and provided that they had someone in their office who would be dedicated as a victim witness advocate, or sometimes they're called coordinators. Uh, the prosecutors in Michigan corporately raised the issue of this is wonderful. We certainly are all for it. And by the way, I, I must say, prosecutors were very very supportive. But they raised the, the eternal question, what about money? Who's going to pay for this? And uh, Michigan had a law at that time, a, a court decision, I should say, at that time, that did not permit us to put an assessment, a blanket assessment against convicted defendants. Uh, and so we were confined to using the general fund of the state of Michigan to pay for them. But we were successful in doing that. I made a commitment that I would fight to use general fund money to support the implementation of crime victims' rights, and that worked. Now, that brought us up to 1988 with the <coughs> Constitutional Amendment. One of the, uh, one of the first things I wanted to do with the Constitutional Amendment was to eliminate this court case, called, the case was called Barber, uh, to eliminate the effect of that court case so that we could uh, put an assessment against convicted defendants. So. The last provision in our constitutional amendment, the provisions in our amendment, it, it, our amendment is not very long, but it is in a state with 30,000 lawyers, Michigan that is, it has never been challenged, ever. Uh, and it works, uh, it works very well. The last provision says the legislature may provide for an assessment against convicted defendants to pay for crime victims' rights. Once the constitution passed, we, that superseded that court case. And uh, we do that. We assess, we assess uh, convicted criminals, uh, $60 for a felony, $50 for a, what we call a serious misdemeanor. Those are misdemeanors that carry some victimization with them, as contrasted to what we call spitting on the sidewalk misdemeanors. And uh, that brings in money. And that money is, we, I put in the law the, the uh, statutory scheme for the distribution. We require that that, along with restitution, be the first thing ordered by the judge. That's required in our law. And second, that it be the first thing collected. Now that money is then distributed to the victim witness advocate offices in every county in Michigan, and, and all 83 counties in Michigan now have one. The prosecutor based. Prosecutor based. So they are paid directly. They we pay for we pay for the typical activities of a prosecutor-based victim witness advocacy. If there is money left over, that money goes into the Crime Victim Compensation Fund, which helps pay expenses for victims who have been injured as a result of the crime. That money has been coming in very well, and we're about to do an audit of uh, the different jurisdictions to find out if there are those who may not be sending in all the money or ordering it or collecting it in a way that we think that the statute clearly says. So uh, it has become a self-funded process, both the Compensation Fund and, and uh, Crime Victims' Rights, without tax money. One of the few states to do so, we might add. Um, if, if, do you think there were any failures in our field? We're 31 years old now. Have there been any failures? Well, we should have done it earlier. It, it took a while. Uh, you've been in this a uh, long time, Ann, and I know that you have a better grasp of failures than I do. I, I don't know of failures. I know of some successes. Uh, and, uh, but but I, the, the, the failures maybe have been informational kinds of failures. I've been invited to speak from time to time in other states, and, and the story is almost always different, but I'll not forget a... Uh, a, a story from uh, one of the states I, I visited. A victim came up to me after I spoke and described how 
her daughter had been kidnapped, raped, murdered, and dismembered, and she had to identify her remains from a shoebox full of bones. And she simply wanted to talk to her legislator and was unable to make an appointment, was, uh, was unable to, to make that arrangement. I, th I thought that was incredible, that a legislator wouldn't pay attention. But we, I think in the early days, it was, it was uh, viewed as an entirely legal matter uh, and therefore didn't deserve policy consideration by legislatures. In, in other states, I found that, um, quite frankly, the committees that would handle crime victims' rights uh, often were dominated by defense attorneys, many of whom are outstanding and have a real sensitivity for victims, but some of them view victims' rights as somehow mitigating the rights of, of the defendant. Again, we made sure that in Michigan that was clearly not what we were, at, what we were about. What do, you, what do you think changed, Bill, um, that made legislatures pay attention in Michigan? But I also want you to think about all sort of all 50 states because the movement today is considered quite effective and strong. And you just told us a story about how it wasn't always so. Tell the youngins today what, what made a difference. Well, I think the difference was we had people both at the individual state level and at the national level. You've been involved in uh, NOVA, in the National Victim Center, the successors to the, that was a successor to the Sunny Van Bulo Victim Advocacy Group, uh, and, and others. You did something that at a state level I don't think we could do. You brought the national media to, uh, to some attention, and that attention was generated information for everybody about victims and victims' rights. It was simply not the topic of discussion. It wasn't, and I don't know why precisely, it wasn't viewed as a uh, top uh, uh, policy issue, but it simply wasn't. Uh, there was an attitude almost, I think, of leave it, to, uh, leave it to somebody else to do. So I think at a national level, uh, the, the groups, uh, the groups which, which you represent uh, and a number of other people with whom you and I have both worked, brought an attention that could only be brought by some national attention and some national promotion. If you are going to uh, identify one greatest accomplishment that has promoted victims' rights in youth, Bill, what would it be, one? Probably the impact statement process would be the one. Uh, the public often thinks that restitution is the most important to victims, and we have very strong restitution language, pages of it. Uh, how it it's a, must be ordered as a priority, it must be collected as a priority, it must be given the first priority, and all those sorts of things. And yes, restitution is important, but victims want the sense of justice that an impact statement gives. And in our law, we not only give them the right to do it orally, or they can do it in writing, or they can do both. In fact, they can do a, there's a third option. If they simply want to talk to the person who prepares the sentencing report for the judge, they can do that as well. It requires a judge uh, that the judge uh, listen, and it gives a sense of, of getting some justice uh, to the victim. In most cases, they are never made whole, and they recognize that going in that they're never going to be made whole, but at least it is. I view that as, as one of the most important rights in our law, at least. We will tell Jim Rowland tomorrow that you said that. It's very, very touching. Um, Bill, what's needed today to continue the, the growth and professionalism of our field, or if you can think of anything that's missing that will keep propelling us ahead, if you will? Well, I think it's important to recognize that there has to be a system in place. and. At the state level, I think that is not always the case, but a system organized, backed by statute, hopefully backed by constitutional amendment and, and, uh, at, at the state level, uh, is, I, I think, critically important to, uh, to keep crime victims' rights uh, as a viable issue and as an issue that is progressing. I think 
getting together, comparing notes, all the victim advocates in Michigan and I get together about three times a year, informally, but it's it's but regularly, and uh, those are very educational. My conversations with people in the national scene, yourself, just for example, Steve Twist, David Beatty, and many others. Uh, I shouldn't start naming them because there are a lot of wonderful people at the national level who have just insisted that we not let crime victims' rights uh, die, and and they have not. Um, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a sidebar, Bill. The, the juvenile justice system um, it was something that, uh, but, you know, back, back in 1983, were you looking at the juvenile justice system, and I think what's changed over the past 30 years? Well, we weren't. In 1983, uh, we weren't. In fact, uh, the prevailing philosophy was what we call a treatment philosophy, and that is that all kids are, are basically good, and even if they commit horrible crimes, uh, just uh, uh, giving them some psychological counseling and so on is going to be enough. We found out later that juveniles commit some of the most horrendous crimes and can be serial killers, and we've had a couple of those cases in, uh, in Michigan within the last 10 years. Uh, so we used a different set of language. Uh, we didn't call them crimes, we called them offenses. We didn't call it uh, a trial, we called it an adjudication. We didn't call it a sentence, we called it a disposition. All of which deny the criminality component in what some juveniles do. Now I'm not suggesting in any way that we treat juveniles generally like adults. I think there has to be a separate system for them. Uh, but the problem, at least in Michigan for a time, was that uh, diversionary programs became so informal that the requirements for notice and participation and restitution and protection and so on that we had for victims of adult crimes uh, were not being given to victims of juvenile crimes. And again, some of those were uh, the kinds of vicious crimes that made adult crimes uh, look not, uh, not quite, as, uh, quite as bad. So in uh, 1988, we did uh, a couple of things. One, I added uh, the, our original act covered victims of felony crimes. Uh, and by 1988, we recognized that there were some misdemeanors that carried with them significant victimization. So we made a list of those. We called them serious misdemeanors and, and put in place the full panoply of rights for victims of uh, misdemeanors, of, of serious uh, misdemeanors. We also then decided that we needed to deal with victims of juvenile crime. The juvenile system is so very different. It's much less, as, as you well know, it's much less formal. And so some of our courts, frankly with heavy dockets maybe and just trying to reduce uh, their loads, uh, and, and maybe for other reasons as well, uh, would put in place uh, diversions. Now, I, I like diversions. I encourage diversions when they are justified. But what was happening is it was being used as a method, either consciously or unconsciously, to cut out the victim in the process. So we finally changed our Crime Victims Rights Act and put it into three components. One, Article One is, or Chapter One, requires full victims' rights for felony victims. Article two for for juvenile victims of juvenile crime, which would equate uh, to adult crime, and Article three would be for serious misdemeanors. You were the first state then again uh, to in 1988 to tackle the whole juvenile justice system issue. Bill, advice. What advice can you give to professionals and volunteers who have more recently joined our field in the, in the last, from one to ten years ago, who weren't there in 1982 with you? Well, they know a lot more about it than I do, and they're particularly those who have become advocates are, uh, in, the, in the thick of things. I would say it is a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. It's a wonderful vocation or avocation. Uh, volunteer or full-time professional, working with victims is extremely rewarding. Yes, it is. All right. What vision do you have, Bill Van Regenwarder, for the future of our 
towards the wilderness and guide them from there? Well, I think we've been looking at a, uh, at a national constitutional amendment now for some years. And I think, without going into specifics, that there is a form of national, uh, a, a national constitutional amendment that makes that will make some sense. I think it needs to make. All right, Bill. Back to vision for the future of our field. Well, first would be I think. Uh, Crime Victims' Rights Act, comprehensive law, in every state in the, in the country. I'm not telling other states what they should do, but I think it is uh, a noble effort. I think it responds to one of the things that state government ought to be doing, and that is providing for the public protection. This is a form of, of uh, public protection. Second, I think there is some merit to the concept of a national constitutional amendment. I think it needs to be carefully drafted, which goes, I guess, without saying. Uh, so it doesn't preempt uh, what states have already done, but maybe builds upon it, supports it, and uh, maybe provides an umbrella under which uh, states which have not formed constitutional amendments or Crime Victims' Rights Act or either uh, give them some incentive to do so. What is it going to take, Bill, to um, pass a federal amendment? Well, it requires ratification by three-quarters of the states. So the states will have a big voice in it. A number of states uh, have their own constitutional amendments. A number of states, like Michigan, have their own statute. So I think part of what will have to happen is those states will have to be satisfied that they won't be preempted, that Second, that they won't be that what they've done won't be replaced, and uh, third, that there be a a cooperation uh, that uh, gives them the freedom and flexibility to do the right thing under uh, an, a, a kind of a, a foundational umbrella is maybe the best way I can put it. Do you think that um, that you will see a federal constitutional amendment passed in your lifetime? It's going to be difficult because um, be, it's going to be difficult because of what I just mentioned. Those, uh, I think, concerns that states are going to have about states already are concerned about the federal government imposing itself on on states. It's just one of those things that uh, that happens. It's kind of a uh, an informal Tenth Amendment concern. Uh, but so, so there's a there's a built-in reluctance, I think, on the part of some states to do that. Uh, I don't, if your question is, what is it going to take, I think it's going to take a cooperative effort uh, and language that is probably supportive of those states already well into the constitutional amendment at the state level and statutory uh, phase. And uh, and to encourage those who are not into that to, to move forward, probably going to involve some money. And I know at a deficit budget time such as uh, we're in as we speak, that may not be an easy thing to promise. More than three thousand dollars, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bill, what's your greatest fear? I really, I don't have a, a greatest fear. I think that there's, <laughs> maybe I should have, but I, I, I can't think of a greatest fear. Well, certainly a great fear would be uh, uh, any diminishment of crime victims' rights, and particularly the movement. I think the movement has been uh, powerful. Uh, it's been great to see the different organizations, victim organizations particularly, uh, pulled together. There's been, I know, some very healthy discussion and some disagreement on some aspects, but I think, I think it is, uh, I think it is healthy, and I think it shows an, uh, a viability to the movement that uh, inaction or just uh, quiet acceptance doesn't depict.
I, it's been my experience, and I'm sure others who work with victims have had the same experience, that so, sometimes victims, because of the crime, are left without any resource and have an immediate crisis, an emergency, and no safety net. Uh, in Michigan, I founded something we call the Crime Victim Foundation. Well, we call it that because it is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit corporation. Its purpose is simple. It's it's uh, it, it is operated entirely by volunteers. And its purpose is to be a last resort safety net for victims of crime who, because of the crime, through no fault of their own, face an immediate crisis. It then has a small grant program, and uh, we're we raise money for it. Our victim advocates uh, around the state of Michigan hold bake sales, uh, hold auctions, uh, sometimes hold raffles and uh, use that money to fund the Crime Victim Foundation. And we have requests uh, every day. I have a, a fast example of uh, a disabled person whose only means of transportation was a small scooter to go to work, to visit a, a mother who was in, uh, in a hospital. That was stolen. It was recovered, but this person was unable to pay storage fee for it and so for the lack of a couple of hundred dollars lost uh, lost the scooter lost the ability to get to work lost the ability to visit mother in the hospital uh, now we stepped in with something like that and and provided a grant and that's that's how it set up uh, Jeff Daniels of uh, dumb and dumber fame and national uh, uh, movie fa fame uh, has uh, a theater called the Purple Rose Theater in Michigan, Chelsea, Michigan, which is where he's from. And uh, he put on uh, an early play called, which later became the movie, Escanabe in the Moonlight, as a fundraiser uh, for us. So that's fairly uncommon, but uh, we're, I'm very grateful to Jeff Daniels for lending his name and his uh, theater and his play uh, as a fundraising event uh, for what we're doing. That is designed, but the, uh, and we have a request almost every day for that. It's not a big fund, and so we put we have to put some limits on uh, what we can fund. But it is it is uh, very worthwhile. Is it available to the uh, state of Michigan? It, we incorporated it in a way that it can be used by other states as well. And so, if there are citizens of other states, we have we don't have a system. Uh, other than just dealing with individual requests, but it, it, we are working toward making it available in other states as well. At this time, it may be a little difficult because our system is incomplete for other states. It's incorporated in a way, however, that it can, we can use it for other states as well. Um, Bill, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you just are itching to tell us? Anything else? Victim empowerment has brought an integrity to the system that wasn't there before. Victims are now involved. Judges mention it all the time. I'm, I smile from time to time. Uh, judges will mention uh, uh, to victims that, um, that they are going to get their rights, and, that, and some judges will make quite a production of that. <clears throat> I, uh, I appreciate that a lot. Also, the system, from law enforcement to prosecutors to the courts, uh, recognize that they're being watched, that victims are now have a, a participatory role in what is happening in the courtroom and have a real interest. And what we do is print the Crime Victims' Rights Act. Now, I wrote the law in a way that follows the ordinary sequence of a typical court case. And I also wrote it in plain English. And all the notices that we require, it clearly says, must be in plain English, understood by ordinary people. So you don't have to hire a lawyer to understand what your rights are. And then we put that, uh, that act in a booklet along with some other supporting material. We make that available to crime victims throughout the state of Michigan. This book, the booklet looks like this. And it, is, uh, it has a summary of the act. It has the act itself, the law itself, word for word. Every, uh, every word is there. So people can read it, can say, well, you know what? I want to take advantage of this. And many victims in Michigan will take this booklet into the courtroom with them, and they'll say, "Your Honor, here is my right under the under the Crime Victims' Rights Act." And that's a again a powerful reminder. We go through thousands of these every year.